This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 42 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Index Fund Advisors, IFA.com. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. Today on Horsemanship Radio, we have Bunny Sexton and Diana Good, and both are shaping the future generations of students of horsemanship. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thank you for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 15th and the 30th of the month. And today, I have my producer, Jen, with me today. Jen, how are you? I'm doing great. My turn, my turn, my turn. It is. I'm so glad you're here. We have, uh, you know, we have somebody for, that has a little pony club in their background that we get to yes, talk about. Yes, I'm very too. excited to hear what uh, Bunny Sexton has to say. I was glued to my TV, to my computer Watching mm. the Rolex coverage this year, Isn't that awesome, and it, it was just—it was wonderful to watch Bunny go around. She was just so positive and so she was so yeah. in the moment. You could tell it was—it yeah. it meant something to her, and it was a lot of fun to watch her. And she hopped off her horse, and her her smile was so big. So I can't big. wait to talk to her. Oh, I know she, yeah, she is amazing. I mean, she really has set the world of eventing on the fire on fire, as well as uh, inspired a bunch of little kids, you know, that probably go eventing. Yeah. Let me look that up, you know, yeah. and, and learn a lot more about it. So I'm really excited to talk to her today too. So, so I haven't talked to you a little bit about your horses lately. What you've been doing in the field? What have I been doing in the field? Um, getting all the time, getting better with Pablo, the next door neighbor horse, <laughs> Good. who, uh, I had mentioned last time we were together that he has has gotten better about coming to me. He, I let yeah. him catch me when I go out every day and Perfect. it's got, it's getting in little tiny increments better. It's interesting now because it started out that he would come to me willingly and happily and stand to get his halter put on willingly. But then mm-hmm. as soon as I opened the gate and walked out of the pasture to get to the next pasture, the yeah. connection would disappear. He would be distracted yeah. and just looking for the next panther that was going to eat him because the whole yeah. world was going to eat him. <laughs> and they were going to eat him slowly. <laughs> That's what Poor he thinks. Guy. And um, in the past month or no, so I've noticed now that he, the connection lasts a lot longer. We can be out where there are distractions mm-hmm. and things to look at. And he's much, much more likely to stay with me in that in that philosophical sense, he's with me. Okay. There's, mm-hmm. there's something moving over there in the corner and the ear will go, but he's with mm-hmm. me. And that's Good. kind of interesting to, to go through with him. I'm Good. Doing... You see him relaxing out there, a little licking and chewing. Huge maybe. difference. It used to be mm-hmm. his head was straight up in the air. He was yeah. on guard at all times. Mm-hmm. And if something startled him, he didn't have any trouble landing on me. <laughs> all 1300 <laughs> pounds of him. He's a big boy. <laughs> And now it's okay. You can carry him. He yeah. knows that. <laughs> My foot can handle that 1,300 pounds. No problem. <laughs> um, and now he's, he's much more prone to having a sigh and putting his mm-hmm. head down. And he actually, one of his favorite things to do right now is he walks along and he, he likes to walk a little bit behind me and he puts his muzzle on my shoulder. Oh, I love that. I yeah. love that. He, he, okay. he seems to find comfort in it because I can hear him breathing a lot more deeply when he's there. Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. I think I find interesting. Yeah, that's yeah, that's it. That's all of it. It's all coming down. That's awesome. Yeah. Really good. Yay. Really good. I'm so glad to hear it. Thanks. I, and speaking of which, mm-hmm. now that that Pablo seems to have figured out there that humans are not necessarily something that's going to come on, come and put pressure on his poor little delicate brain all the time. <laughs> right. We talk a lot in horsemanship these days about pressure, uh, mm-hmm. pressure, apply pressure, release pressure, and that's not something I grew up with when I when I had my formative horsemanship years. Okay. So I'm only just now beginning to grasp pressure. So maybe you can help me out. What is pressure when it as applied to horsemanship? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure there's lots of definitions flying around out there as as people are starting to be empowered to just train a little bit on their own horses and figure out what the horses all about. Let me, let me turn it around. Let me ask you a question about that though. Tell me what you think reward is for a horse. Oh, geez, you didn't, we didn't count on this. You turned it around, (laughs) you rascal. Um, Reward. Well, I think that depends a lot on the horse and the situation. Uh, For Pablo, 
reward is he doesn't feel any pressure. He can just mm-hmm. be Pablo. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. For Beaker, it's a little bit different in that he doesn't have the same perception of pressure, I think, in that for him, reward is, you know, just get to not work. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know, okay. Because his favorite that's thing right. to do is literally stand still. Oh, I um, love that imperative. There's there's six imperatives, and that's the most important one. Stand still. That's good. Well, there we go. So I need to figure out what PT Scooter's reward is because his least okay. favorite thing to do is stand still. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to work on that. Too. His reward is move. So um, <laughs> from the reward point of view, I think that might vary a little bit from situation to situation and from horse to horse. Am I completely off base? No, you're absolutely right, but it it does depend on their experience. But speaking to the nature of horses, reward is is more about taking pressure off. That's a reward for horses. That's an award for horses for having done something that we communicated correctly, and then we take that pressure off, and that's where they go. Ah, oh, that's where Pablo is going. Ah, oh, I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. And so you know, a lot of times. Uh, we have a game that we like to play with students called the yes, no game. And it really is kind of like hot or colder, you know, that mm-hmm. game, <laughs> mm-hmm. but it, it, but it helps you think about how the horse thinks when we're trying to communicate something to them, when we're training them, or even if, you know, ground, we start everything from the ground and, and it just so helps build a relationship with a horse to start so much of your training from the ground. Even, even if this horse is, you know, pre-trained when you get him, mm-hmm. um, and so the pressure is when we build our intensity to say, this is what we're asking, or uh, even just from the ground, pay attention to me. That's eyes on eyes. That's shoulders square on a horse. That's squaring up in kind of a leadership, maybe even go away look, you know, mm-hmm. mode. Um, and when you go on a 45, like you've done in the pasture with Pablo, and you uh, fold your arms in and you avert your eyes and you invite that horse to you, see, that's taking that pressure off. So pressure and release in the very fundamental language of the horse in the herd, you know, is that um, release of demand. Let's put it that way, if you want to call it demand or release of pressure. So that's the first, in the nature of Equus, that's how I think of it when you ask me, you know, what is pressure on a horse? But pressure in the saddle can also be an ask. You know, you're asking the horse to do something. Let's just say you're just sitting on a horse in a typical saddle of whatever you're normally in. And you squeeze, you just think maybe go forward. And if you, if your horse is trained and is really in sync with you and he understands you and you understand him, and you just think go forward, there's little muscles that are happening in there and firing in your body that the horse can read. That's pretty darn sensitive. Another reason Mm -hmm. for no whips. I'll I'll get on my whip thing some other time. (laughs) (laughs) Take note. We'll we'll use that on a different show. Got it. I took notes. Okay. (laughs) To check. Um, But, you know, if you're thinking forward, you're, you're squeezing it just a little bit and you're you know, there, there is urge in your body and the horse will go forward. What should you do immediately when that horse moves forward? Well, you need to stop doing whatever you just said to make him go exactly. forward. You take that pressure off because he's done the right thing. And the horse registers that in his computer and says, oh, I did the right thing because he should immediately. So it's that timing thing that I think all of us equestrians work really hard to, to get better and better well, at. Make another you know? note here, timing. Timing is another one. The nemesis of so many riders. Yes, Yes. exactly, exactly. So so that's that's pressure on, pressure off. I I think people do put um, pressure on horses sometimes without even knowing you're doing it. For for example, as I just mentioned, the eyes on eyes. A lot Mm -hmm. of people love to look at their horses in the eyes, and horses can become desensitized to that, but it never is really comfortable for them, you know, because Mm -hmm. in in the horse world, that really does mean go away. That's a predator flight animal, you know, just doesn't work together that mm-hmm. well. So, the, you know, a horse that loves his, you know, 12-year-old girl since she was five will tolerate the, her just, you know, loving Gazing on... Gazing into his eyes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing that out. But but in horse language, that is not comfortable. And what is comfortable is taking pressure off, averting eyes, going soft and, and turning away. And that, that's when you get that Velcro feeling of a horse going, oh, I trust you and thank you for taking that pressure off and I'm going to follow you all over the place. And, you know, and that doesn't mean that outside influences 
don't bring up that uh, adrenaline again. But Mm -hmm. for the most part, when a horse trusts you and you've got that leadership, you move the feet because you're moving forward and they believe you. They, you know, we, we say to our, we just had a horse and some healing weekend with our uh, veterans and first responders this last weekend. And one of the first things you, you try to help them to say, it sounds funny, but is March, you know, because once you've got that horse, once you've got that horse following you, you want to be a leader. You want to stand erect and you want to say, I'm going over here. It's safe to go over here and I'm heading there. You better come with me. You know, and they go, whoa, okay, yeah, I'm coming with you. You're, you know what you're doing. But if you kind of skulk away, which seems funny that a soldier would do that, you know, because right. right? they learn to march. But but they think they have to kind of stay in that soft, you know, 45. See, I'm glad yeah. you went there. See, this is perfect because that's one of the things that I've been – becoming more aware of when I'm working with Pablo because he is so sensitive. He gives it, the feedback is just crazy because mm. he doesn't have any of it. Whereas PT and Beaker have desensitized to so much of the, bo- the body language of a human mm-hmm. and they have an innate trust at this point. It's like, I don't care if you're waving your arms around. It don't mm-hmm. mean nothing. That's mm-hmm. the way they feel. Whereas Pablo, if I blink too quickly, he notices it. Right. Um, and as I get him, to trust me and follow me a little bit, I've been struggling with where I need to keep my posture Mm -hmm. with where I need to be. So I've been experimenting with it a little bit. I've tried walking with different types of posture um, to see how he reacts with it. And it's interesting that you mentioned that once you've made that connection and they trust you to follow you, you Mm -hmm. need to be aware of that posture because the horse does notice it. Yes. Yes. And a lot of people will say, um, like they'll say, okay, you got that going for you between you and Pablo. Could somebody else step in, another human, step in? And if your movements were the same, would Pablo react the same way? Pretty much the answer would be yes. Now you could take out, like if you had a racing heart rate, the Mm -hmm. second person, you know, maybe there were some other things going on. But assuming all things being somewhat equal, he would. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like they really think, oh, one human's bad, another human's great. They they do know you and they'll nicker Mm -hmm. to you when you come. But pretty much they throw all humans in the same bucket. They're going to be prone to generalizing. Yeah, they do. That's, you know, that predator better act in the same way that Jen did, because if he doesn't, then I might think he, no, this, this could be the one, this is the predator. Mm -hmm. And so if you, you know, if, if everybody acts according to their nature and that's what we want to study, it's just like learning French, you know, it's the horse's gestural language. It's not ours. And it's based on, you know, bazillion years of, Mm -hmm. of survival. Mm -hmm. Um, if we act predatorial, they will react as a flight animal. If we don't act predatorial, if we act like a, a a leader out there, I know it sounds, you just have to watch a lot of video to see what that French looks like. But, Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you've got your physio right and you've, you've got everything else going for you and you're in a non-distracting environment, then there's, there's no reason why they wouldn't trust you. Great stuff as usual. Aww. As Aww. usual. This yeah. is so great. I well, learn from the best. That's yeah, right. <laughs> Thus, Monty Roberts University, video after Thank video. You. Short and sweet, though. I like that because they're it'll, it's little tiny servings so that it's easy to digest. Thank you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's hear from our title sponsor, IFA.com, and then Diana Good is going to join us. Hi, I'm Mark Hebner, president of Index Fund Advisors and proud owner of Monty Roberts Willing Partners graduate, He's a Sugar Bear. (laughs) You know, investment portfolios are a lot like horses. You need to find one that best suits you, your temperament, and your stage of life. Some people might like an energetic horse and an aggressive investment portfolio, while others are more comfortable with a gentle ride and a more conservative investment portfolio. The trick is to find the one that's right for you. That's what Index Fund Advisors is all about, matching people with portfolios, risk-appropriate, low-cost, and globally diversified investment portfolios. You can find the right portfolio for you by taking the Risk Capacity Survey at IFA.com. That's IFA as an Index Fund Advisors. Or... You can call us toll-free at 888-643-3133. That's 888-643-3133.
Diana Good's love for horses began when she was about three years old, when a teacher asked what she wanted to be when she grew up, and she answered, I want to ride horses. She says the first pony she ever rode was Captain, and that she would never forget because the first one teaches you so much. Her father bought her her first horse when she was seven, and she's had horses all her life ever since. First, she rode English, and uh, she... Stopped jumping when she was about, you know, at five foot three. She said, okay, that's enough of that. And she started teaching at a local stable at the age of 14. So she wanted to pay the entry fees to her local shows. And she now has over 28 years of experience. And that includes reining, team sorting, Western pleasure, and she's an avid trail rider. Diana believes in teaching and training without violence. And she enjoys her job and the sharing of her love for horses with children and adults. Welcome, Diana Good. I'm so pleased to have you on our show, Horsemanship Radio. How are you? I'm good, and thank you for having me. I am so glad to have you because we have a we had a question that we wanted answered, and I thought you would be the perfect person to ask of it. You are here in Orange County, California, uh, near where I am, and I often take lessons from you, and I love your... Um, training philosophies, and I love your horses. I think you do a great job. And I would love to start off with um, a little bit about your instruction. So as a a seasoned instructor, you've been doing this a long time, what do you wish your students would would do to get the most out of your lessons? See, I'm speaking for myself a little bit here too. Well, I think what I, I want them to do most is, one, to be enjoying themselves and having a good time while they're learning something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's true. Miserable students probably aren't too much fun for you. (laughs) Is that right? Yeah, and I think it's, um, you have to be well-balanced and um, pretty much non-emotional and um, just come out to enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Now, the one thing that I know is probably the hardest thing for instructors to do is keep really good lesson horses around. And, and I know you have, you have a string of them, but I know it takes talent and it takes a good vet and it takes a good fairy and it takes a good team to keep them around. So what do you look for in a good lesson horse, Diana? You know, the first thing I look for in a good lesson horse is um, their mind. Mm-hmm. Um, just to make sure that they um, think things through before they act on things. They're pretty quiet. They take a little bit more leg um, to get them moving forward. Um, and I just I just need a horse that doesn't escalate into situations. They kind of just peer out, see what's happening, think about it, and then react. So do you have to go through a lot? Do you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find a good lesson (laughs) horse? (laughs) Yes, yes. They are very, very hard to come by, and they're never for sale when you do get a good one. (laughs) I suppose. Yeah, you keep your horses for life, right? Yes, yes, I do. I do. Once they've worked for me, they stay with me until they're not here anymore. I love that. I love your philosophies, and I I love how you treat your horses. Uh, Who's the best lesson horse you have right now? The best that- lesson mm-hmm. horse I have right now would be Miss Rosie. She Miss- is a 12-year-old quarter horse mare. Yeah, and why? Why is she your best lesson horse right now? Why is she the best lesson horse? She's very well-rounded. She's just as good in the arena as she is out on trail. She doesn't get flustered. She takes care of my two-year-old students as well as my 60-year-old student. You have a two-year-old student? I do. Oh, how cute is that? Are they showing? Are they in lead line classes or anything? Um, They are not showing. Um, He just does walk, jog, but he is no longer on a lunge line or a lead line. He walks and jogs her and steers her on his own. Oh, my gosh. And, and it's a he. You have a student that's a he. A boy. Yeah. <laughs> a boy. We lose them at about three years old, I think. But no, I'm kidding. I hope you have lots yeah, of Yeah, usually boys. by the time they're six. <laughs> okay, six. There you go. Why is that? Why can't we keep more boys in our sport? Um, I think boys like to be a little bit more physically active. 
and mm-hmm. running around and, and, you know, kicking the soccer ball and throwing a baseball. Whereas I think girls um, kind of like the challenge of, you know, the dedication that it takes to come out and ride every week and the mental aspect of it. I think it stimulates girls a little bit more where boys need to be a little bit more physically active. You think that riding horses is not physically, it's not, it's not exciting enough. It's not exhilarating enough for them. Is that it? That's my personal opinion. Yeah. I think they yeah. kind of lose it. Yeah. Might be. Maybe we, we got to start adding maybe guns and ammunition to the lessons. <laughs> or something. You know, I, I, I kind Cowboy of agree. Shooting. I kind of agree yeah. with you in that with, with little boys, they're, they're all about that adrenaline rush very early on. And unfortunately for them, when you're riding well, there's not a big adrenaline rush. Yeah. It's when it's going wrong that there's an adrenaline <laughs> rush. <laughs> That's yeah. not a good thing to encourage. <laughs> right. Cause we're trying to teach them to not get the adrenaline rush when things are going wrong so we can That's correct right. it and make things go right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and uh, the the lessons are they culminating in shows? Do you take all your students off to shows, and and uh, is that the goal? You know what? I don't have goals like that in my program. I try to monitor, mon- have my teaching for what my client wants to do. Mm-hmm. I have some people who just want to have good horsemanship skills and are avid trail riders, and then I have some students who are very competitive and, and want to go to horse shows and compete in showmanship and trail and horsemanship and all of those things. So I don't have any set program. I try to um, curtail my teaching to what my client wants to learn and do. Sounds like good business. I imagine that makes good <laughs> sense. <laughs> and and you have a couple of the Willing Partners horses, uh, Monty and Pat Roberts trained Willing Partners horses out there, which I'm proud to say that you've uh, you've got them in training out there uh, they're graduates but you keep them tuned up with their owners and yeah, yeah and you do a great job and Jen will know uh, what I'm talking about when I say we all went to Montaña del Oro which is that beach ride oh. and Diana is, yes, Diana's our our fearless leader of the whole thing. She gets us all over the mountaintops and everything. So, you know, we can talk about lessons in the arena and we can talk about going to shows and stuff. But I'm telling you, she is a kick butt trail girl. That's the thing. Now, it's something I'm very passionate about. I love trail. Diane, Hmm. do you think that having your school horses be able to go out and do these types of genuinely adventurous trail rides. This isn't just right. hacking around the back pasture. Do you think that um, improves their outlook and helps to keep them fresh for when they're to, uh, going around the ring with those bare bones up down beginners? You know, most definitely. I think, um, like me myself personally, I get a little bored going around in circles all the time, which <laughs> I know that it's, there's a necessity to it, and I get it. But I think it stimulates their mind and their bodies and it gives them other life experiences whether it's the gardener with the leaf blower or the trash truck or a coyote or a deer running off into the brush you know I think it just kind of is a little bit more refreshing for them to get to do something different yeah do you have any other techniques that you use to help keep your school horses uh, mentally fresh because being a school horse is rarely physically hard, but mentally those horses work very hard because they're really taking care of their riders. Mm -hmm. You know, I just try to diversify what my school horses are doing. Um, Like I said, you know, some days we just practice pulls and opening and closing gates. And then other days we work on uh, jogging and loping. Other days we go out into the trails. You know, I just think that, um, their job can be a little mundane and hard packing around beginners, you know, a little rough with their mouths or, you know, a little too much leg or not enough leg. So I think you just kind of have to diversify what you're doing every day. So you don't do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've got good horses for that too. Everything from a uh, large draft PMU all the way down to Indy, your little pony out there. And it is, it's fun for the the lessons too, to keep the diversity, uh, ride different horses and have different experiences out there. And, and you keep dogs around and there's, there's a lot going on out there too. How, how do you keep the balance between your love of riding, which you clearly do have that and, and this job that you have, uh, how do you keep from burning out on that? 
You know, I think I don't um, burn out on it because I'm absolutely 100% passionate about it and I love it and I go seven days a week and I wouldn't mm-hmm. have it any other way. Listen to that. Seven days a week. Well, you're I a feel horse woman. Adequate now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <that's> right. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Well, we are actually. When you see this girl in action, she's amazing, and and it's fun. And you're no longer a little girl. Sorry to say this, but you've got grown up kids and everything, right? I do, I do. Yes. Yeah, and and you're proud of them. I if people go on uh, Diana's Facebook page, you'll see that she is a huge rescuer of dogs as well as horses too. Yeah. You've always got the like the the rescue of the week up there, I think, or something too. So people have to check that out. Maybe we can get some more people getting some dogs into circulation because they're really cool. You've got yeah. how many dogs yeah. do you have right now? Um we have four dogs and we have a foster dog. And a foster dog. And and you have at least one rescue out of that four dogs too, right? Um, out of my personal dogs, three of them were rescues oh, and one was awesome. not. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Diana, you're our inspiration. Um, you, you just are, you're doing the job that a lot of people would love to do if they could get the gig, but you're doing it with a lot of balance and with a lot of love for horses and people too. So we would appreciate you coming out today and being on Horsemanship Radio. I hope we can have you back for a trainer's tip. I would love to. Would you? you? Great, great. We'll have you back real soon. And thanks again for coming on Horsemanship Radio. Eventing, also known as horse trials, is an equestrian event where a single horse and a rider combination compete against other combinations across the three disciplines of dressage, cross country, and show jumping. This event has its roots in a comprehensive cavalry test requiring mastery of several types of riding. Eventing could be termed an equestrian triathlon. After this, after this word from Omega Fields, we will hear from Bunny Sexton, who is in top form at age 54. Um, we're really excited because Sean's Omega Fields company has done something amazing for one of our test horses. His name is Cadillac. And we felt so strongly about it that um, we definitely wanted to bring him on as a sponsor of Horsemanship Radio. And we wanted you to know that it came in that um, order first is that we were so impressed with this product and with this horse's results that we wanted to have him a part of our um, our monthly shows. What is it about the Omega Fields product? Something's different. Omega Fields uh, was built around a really um, unique and proprietary technology. Flaxseed has been known for a long time to contain rich source of omega-3 fatty acids along with omega-6 and omega-9 fatty acids in in a near-perfect balance, but historically there was a problem using it. It's high in fat, and when it was uh, milled into a feed product or a food product, it it would go rancid very quickly, so our company had developed a proprietary technology for stabilizing this high-fat flaxseed to make it usable, uh, give it a long shelf life in a natural uh, environment. We don't use any chemicals or additives to mm-hmm. extend the shelf life or anything like that. It's a completely natural process. That's what makes our flax really different. Um, it makes it usable. It makes it nutritious over a long period of time. We guarantee an 18-month shelf life so consumers can use it with confidence without it going rancid that you know would potentially harm the horse. So quality of manufacture, every single thing in that uh, product, Omega Horse Shine, is food grade. It's made at a food grade facility with great care of product quality. Uh, The stabilization technology makes that uh, Omega-3 nutritional value locked in and usable for a long period of time. So proof is in the pudding, so to speak, that it, it really works. You'll see dramatic results in a fairly short period of time. Many of you have heard of Bunny Sexton because she recently finished her first highly competitive Rolex Kentucky three-day eventing, in eventing, event, in eventing, placing 24th out of 75 starters at the age of 54 on the 16-year-old thoroughbred OTTB Rise Against. She calls him Echo. He's an off-the-track thoroughbred. 
Bunny started off on Hunter Jumpers at about 14 years of age in local shows and some A-rated shows. And then her mom and another person started a pony club in the San Inez Valley in California, and she was introduced to eventing. She has not only experienced it all now, she has trained and mentored some young people all the way to the top events, too. Welcome, Bunny Sexton, to Horsemanship Radio. I'm so glad to have you on finally, Bunny. How are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be on your show. You are awesome to be on our show. You've done some remarkable things, girl, in this last year. And you just, you, you're, you're practically the poster child for eventers, I think, because eventers love persistence. Am I right? Yes, that is true. That is true. And, it, you know, in our place, we've always thought that um, Pony Club and teaching kids about eventing actually taught them about the process of life. Because in every event, you'll have the highs and lows. Everything will seem great. You know, horse will throw a shoe. Then you might not compete. Then they run out at a jump. So, you yeah. know, you run the gamut of success and failure several times in a weekend. And it just really teaches you about it's got to be about the process, not just the ribbon. And I think that stands us all in good stead dead with our horses. Yeah, you're a great mentor, Bunny. I know that you're sitting on an old farmhouse. It's one of the oldest ones in the San Inez Valley, which you and I are both raised in. How old is that exactly. house? Exactly. Um, let's see. I have a picture in front of me. I'm not entirely sure when it was made. I know that we got it in December of 57, and we have a picture of it in 1882. Oh, I know wow. it is the oldest wood structure um, in the San Inez Valley, I but totally I would. don't know its exact age. I don't. Office. Yeah, my husband would know okay. that better than I would. That's all right. I, I just think you probably it was the caves and then you guys. So it's great. Yeah, there you go. It's beautiful. The old Dorrance Ranch, and it's a, it's a it's a very cool house. Where we just moved up from diesel water heat to propane, so we're we're living the wildlife. <laughs> well, you're a mother of four, and you've been battling Lyme disease for a couple of years, and you've got your equine partner named Echo, who's a 16-year-old failed racehorse, <laughs> a thoroughbred that was was probably uh, deemed too wild by the previous owners uh, to, to hold it together. So how did you hold it together after you realized um, that? Oh, yeah? Yeah, well, the thing is, when I met Echo, um, he had had some really good riders. I mean, the rider that had him before me is a brilliant jumper rider, that was making a name for himself in eventing, and he and his wife had cheered the horse. And frankly, you know, the horse just was so talented in jumping, people hadn't laid enough groundwork in the early years mm. on the flat. And so he just always thought the sky was falling in dressage. He anticipates, he wants to please, and in doing so, he loses the the um, ability to be ridden through his back and the relaxation that's so crucial to dressage. Mm -hmm. It's not because he's quote unquote wild so much as he just wants to please. And so he, if you want one flying change, he wants to give you five and that's an issue. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's great. So probably his most difficult of the three events that take place in eventing is the dressage then, right? Well, no question. And that's why I was able to get him because he would have been way out of my price range had he been um, a horse that was getting more than 50% in dressage. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm an emotional person. He's an emotional horse and Mm -hmm. I've always been good with that kind of horse. So I just thought we would complement each other and hopefully pull it together to make it to advanced. Yeah. Great. Well, you did it. I, I, I love some of the quotes that I've read about you getting ready for this interview that, that you, the best part of training is the, the the focus and that you've always dealt with difficult horses. So you have to be creative. You have to think of new ways to, uh, to help that horse learn. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, horses in, in my, in my experience, horses don't go out there wanting to get in trouble, wanting to get, um, discipline for things. They really are just trying to find, you know, the path of least resistance. And for Echo, that was flight, you know, with many horses, fight or flight. Well, Echo um, obviously goes to flight and he does it during the dressage. And he is one that is just insecure and is always trying to do what you say. But we give him so many signals due to the fact he's so sensitive. Mm -hmm. Every little move means something to him. And he was just getting overwhelmed mentally. So the game has been how to let off some energy, how to do meditative work with him, just like you would with a hyperactive person. Mm -hmm. 
And um, it's been good for me as well as him because I'm a very nervous, self-conscious, um, shy person. So it's done well for both of us. So you can focus on the creative aspects of that and it kind of takes your mind out of the, the nervousness of, of training. Absolutely. I get to be his confidence and dressage and generally we'll start off um, – most most new tests, he'll start off anticipating every flying change and every counter counter, and getting very emotional about it. Now going up the ranks, it wasn't. It, it's always a new movement, whether that's a half pass, whether that it doesn't matter what it is. He'll fixate on it and decide that that's where the pressure is and that's where he's going to go. Sorry, I have a lot of dogs here. I love um, it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in any case. Um, Every time we go up a level, it takes a few tests until um, he realizes the sky is not falling, and then we can start actually, he, I can start riding him from behind and getting his back through, and um, that's when the scores start coming in that could put him in the hunt. Um, the test at Rolex was very new to him, and, you know, just because we um, know better than to school him too much on flying changes before the test. It could have been a better test had it been, you know, the third time he had done that test, but it is the way it is. I think he held the trot work together well, and we've been working on um, desensitizing him to the changes ever since. Gotcha. I was going to ask you what his difficulties were for the dressage. I I love how you talk about um, helping the horse feel good about the job um, that they're doing. But one of the beautiful things that I read about you is that you watch Echo sometimes out in the field, just jumping on his own. Well, you know, what was interesting, that was a little bit of a misquote and, and okay. only to the extent that when I have, um, when I hack in the field, I was trying to explain how horses are not forced to jump. I could uh. not possibly imagine how you would force a horse to jump the terrifying ditch walls that we did yeah. at Rolex. <laughs> Echo loves it. Now, he is prone to, when I am in the arena, setting up jumps, running around, jumping a couple, and jumping out occasionally. (laughs) So um, that is true. And when we're jumping cross-country, we have a large herd out in the field of about 30 horses. It does. um, They form love relationships, and they will follow each other over fences. So (laughs) it is something we see a lot. It's not, if, if the horse doesn't love the job, they shouldn't be in the job. Yeah. Um, and that's so important to me. Sometimes they have to see that they love it because there's so much trauma involved in their past training that you have to overcome that. Mm-hmm. But Echo is always treated very, very well in the jumping department. And he has always, although been excitable over fences, he has always loved to jump. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, a lot of people uh, were just coming off the Triple Crown win here. Yeah, that um, was and so phenomenal. So that was phenomenal. so fun. Wasn't that fun to watch? And and uh, and the Belmont is, you know, an extra long race. But you could really see, I think, American Pharaoh just um, running on his own, running his heart out. And we've Absolutely. always said— Absolutely, and so yeah. relaxed in doing yeah. so. And I think, you know, that's probably why my horse is a terrible racehorse. I imagine he sweated it out well before he got to the gate. And yeah. had nothing left. There you because go. Because I, 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 I it's do think- just his mentality. He needs to get out there in the warm up ring for cross country. I do very little because he just can't take the other horse's attention. He he soaks it in the same way I soak in people's energy. And so you know, American Pharaoh is just so content and self contained. He was amazing out there. I he looked so relaxed. He was doing his job that he loved. Yeah, and he's good That's at. Why he's I mean, he's just physically an exceptional creature too. He, he's so yeah, smooth. You could watch the other horses kind of bouncing along where he's just smooth as glass out there. So, so yeah, it does, so it, beautiful it, to watch. it does make you want to find the job that the horse really can excel in and, and not fight the, the system. At yeah. All. Yeah. My horse is doing what he absolutely passionately loves. Good. Um, I am, very, very uh, adverse to going fast. I love the puzzles of upper level eventing. I love getting the line exactly right so that he can be successful in his jumping. But I don't exactly look at the jumps. I look over them at my line and Echo is the one that drags me to them and says, we are doing this, Mom. (laughs) Otherwise, I wouldn't feel like, I have to feel like they are getting um, what they need out of the sport. Otherwise, it, it, it would never feel right to me. And there's so many horses that come here that do end up doing different things. 
whether it's they go to become trail horses or they would rather be out, um, you know, running around playing a little Western pleasure horse. We take in all kinds of horses and we provide horses to various sports that they don't love of any. There's no point in trying to put a square peg in a round hole. There just is. And it's just cool. I think. Yeah. Good for you. And that's a good thing that you teach your, your uh, students too. And I love that. So tell us a little bit about the sport for those of us don't know what, what are the levels bottom to top and, um, you know, what does it take to get to those? Well, in, in, the, in the United States, because we have much less event savvy um, population and we have a lot of people crossing over from the hunter jumper rat ranks, um, our preliminary, which is one of our first international levels, is one of the lower levels in Europe. Now, we go all the way down, like we have a horse tra- trial here next week. We have introduced intro, which is basically telephone pole size jumps on the ground that are taken at the trot and canter for those who want the feeling of going cross country without having to worry about galloping, without having to worry about getting run away with or anything that might befall them if they go any faster or jump any higher. Intro is not a recognized division, but we offer it because it just allows the sport to be opened up to anybody who's ever wanted to jump. Yeah, good. Um, the dressage is, is the same as they do at the lower levels. We then go to beginner novice, um, which is something most hunter jumper people and could be very happy doing. Um, we jump about two nine. We still do the same basic patterns in the dressage at the walk, trot, and canter. And then the show jumps are like you would have in basically a um, low hunter class. Novice is the next level, which in Europe means preliminary at 3.7. Here it means 3 foot 1 inches. A very simple dressage test once again, um, just showing relaxation and acceptance of the bridle. Then the second day you do the cross country, which is just done basically at a canter. And then the third day you show jump what would be a little tougher um, in the in terms of the track of the course, but the jumps are basically hunter tight fences at um, three feet. Mm-hmm. So then we start moving up to training, which is a transitional level. It, it's top height is three foot three, but you start getting more technical questions cross country. The dressage has more lengthenings and shortenings of stride, um, as well as stretching movements where you allow the horse to stretch the ground on very light contact to show that they're very relaxed through the back, which makes them better candidates for upper level work. And then cross country, they have to do the ditches, the water, Mm -hmm. starting to get narrow elements and all these things in culmination. Then we start with the international event event levels. Preliminary, the fences are three foot seven in general. Um, We can have corner fences, which to you guys would look like a very large slice of pie, Mm -hmm. um, where the horses are asked to jump it straight on, where they could run the left end. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. and then in combination with slopes, with ditches, with water, all the things horses would naturally fear, but through proper training, uh, they come to believe the rider won't face them or things that are impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, from then on, you get into the international levels, which would be the one star, which is the international version of preliminary, which is a little bit longer at the horse trial, CIC one star level. Mm -hmm. And then the same number of efforts and a little bit more difficult is the CCI, which is an international three-day event. The only difference being really that the fences are very slightly higher in show jumping. The dressage test is still lengthening, shortening, making sure the basic work is there. Um, You move up to intermediate and the two-star level where we start basically second-level dressage, the shoulder in, the haunches in, turns on the haunches to show the horse is um, actually learning to shift their weight to their hindquarters, doing more collection and extension. Mm -hmm. And then cross country that is reflected in elements where there's no stride between the fences, where they actually bounce over fences, more difficult combinations into water, um, more acute angles to the fences. And then the three-star level, which is um, the Olympic level in general, you start with advanced horse trials, um, the fences shouldn't go much more than 311, and um, the questions are more difficult than they have been in the past. You'll probably have corner to water to um, narrow, jump through a picture frame, and then have a skinny at the bottom. 
have to try to just incrementally increase the difficulty while then increasing the speed all the way along. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get to the three-star level, you're at the Olympic level. At the two-star level, you are um, at the Pan American Games level. Right. The okay. four-star level offered at Rolex and uh, select few European events is not at this time part of any of our international competitions, although there's talk of incorporating it. And is that because so. they want more countries to be able to participate in? Uh, yeah, there are very, as you saw at, at Gal, at, I'm sorry, not Gal, as you saw at Rolex, when you get to the four-star level, even the top three-star horses, there's a 30 percent attrition rate cross country yeah. um when they started having problems the riders pull up because they're not going to they're not going to endanger their horse a few sure. were eliminated because they thought they could make it through um the weather was difficult the combinations instead of having every like five fences be something you have to really really concentrate on um pretty much there are probably only two or three fences there where all i had to do is balance <laughs> Yeah. Um, the rest of them, I had to be game on and have the exact line and memorize wow. what pace to come in. And from then, the horse, you know, it, it's their job to get the jumping done. It's my job to come in with the proper line and power. Wow. Yeah. I, I can't and even imagine. There enough countries that could, yeah, yeah, there yeah. aren't enough countries that could field a team at that level. I imagine. I imagine. So Olympic is three star and you were at four star. You are at four star, which is amazing. Yes, and for Echo, I how am. many how many OTTBs uh, off the off the track thoroughbreds do you think have competed at the Rolex? You know, that's very hard to say overall. I know there were twenty some odd um competing while I was there this year and I unfortunately due to um we have to change his shoes out because he wears pads in California because the ground is so hard. Mm -hmm. And um, when I go there, I have to pull his pads. I was involved in reshoeing him when they had this amazing um, tribute to all the thoroughbreds. And so I missed the actual dinner party and oh, thank you nice, party from the too. Thoroughbred Association. Oh. Um, but they do a tremendous job of, of, at every show I go to, they offer awards for the highest place off the track thoroughbred because these are an incredibly athletic group of animals True. that really can't top any event anywhere in the world if you take the time and have the horse's right mindset for the dressage because mm -hmm. there's superb jumpers. They're not naturally as built for dressage as a lot of the warm bloods are, but almost all the horses that compete at this level have a good degree of thoroughbred blood mm -hmm. in them. Good. Good. I love that. It's a, it's a great... It's a great testament to, to the thoroughbred breed, but it also is great that you guys are tapping into that industry and, and, and you know, repurposing. Well, that's where the majority of my horses have come from. I mean, we've done everything from PMUs, which were the ones out of Canada that were from, mm -hmm. a, from the breeding um, right. of draft horses because they gave the best, they were the most able to um, get hormones from them and right. we retake those horses and make them into lower level event horses. They're amazing. Okay. So they all have their place and I have had some of those horses do the international levels, but with that big a bone, you you mm -hmm. really don't want to put a lot of pounding on a horse that isn't yeah. built for it. So even if yeah. their brains are willing, it's it's a moral choice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I hope that some of your students will be listening to this because I know that they think of you as not only a kind of like their second mom, but also a mentor to them. You have lots of students that you've brought through this journey, which is really fun. And I got to ask you. Uh, you know, if they're going to be listening to this, is it okay to talk about your, like your lucky socks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the thing is they're having to retire because I actually, oh, no. you know, I, yeah, I mean, you know, they, I, I don't want to say where I purchased these very, very <laughs> lovely metallic silver socks that are really funny. But um, since then, I have gotten a lot of gifts of socks from my students. So the Lucky Socks will be changing. And frankly, what I should have also said that I wasn't sure if it would be politically correct is um, I'm very spiritual. I'm not religious per se. But my husband taught me this, this um, prayer once that God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, mm -hmm. the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference heavy on the wisdom. And I actually say that before every dressage test, every cross country and every show jumping so that I take my ego out of the equation and just 
try to sense what's going on with my horse and try to be there for them. Um, I admit that, that I think that is probably more powerful than my socks. So I am willing, <laughs> I am willing to retire my holy socks as it were and, and let my students replace them. I've gotten some really funny ones ever since <laughs> that. So <laughs> I love it. We'll give them a break. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We have one of our presenters that horses in the morning, Jamie Jennings, uh, and she has, don't tell anybody lucky super wet, Superman underwear. So, right? you know, this yes. is. <laughs> yes, I, I identify with this. See, there you go. You know, because you, no you one both gets can to fly. See it and, and, yep, yep, I, I'm all for her. That's great. Well, that's great. Well, I hope the kids do listen to this and I hope that you'll come back and join us sometime again. And, uh, you know, everybody will know about eventing then and we can get into your latest uh, achievements and, and maybe some of your students achievements too. I, I love how you talk about your, your daughter Maddie too, and, um, how you've really taught her life lessons through her career and your career too. Um, it, is she still competing right now? How is she? She is. You know, she's actually taken on one of our homebreds. Um, I got a mare donated to me because she was purchased um, erroneously as a show jumper at a bit, very big sale at the Oaks. And she, she couldn't jump her way out of a box. And one of my ex-students called and said, this mare is going to end up in slaughter if you don't save mm-hmm. her. So mm-hmm. I did save her and she could not jump her way out of a box. However, um, she is an invaluable brood mare. She throws uh-huh. big powerful, beautiful, lovely minded babies. And I crossbred her and got one that we home raised and that my daughter has now moved up to the training level Ah. and she's learning how to start from scratch and whether or not he ends up being the horse for her in the future, who knows, but she's learning how to actually do it from the start. And I think that's hugely important. She had a lot of older horses that she learned from and now it's her turn to give back to the ones that are younger. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, wish her luck for us. And I, I read a quote from you that I want to see if, if it's attributed correctly, but if it is, I love it. You said the point of any athletic endeavor is to inspire and to have that kind Absolutely. of effect on people's lives. Yeah, it's truly an honor yeah. and that you feel privileged to have been there. And if that is true, you are my hero, Bunny Sexton. Oh, no, totally. And the, the responses I got from people who thought their careers were over at 20 because they had, had kids. Mm-hmm. I was astounded at how many people thought that it was even unusual because it's not like I just sat home and knitted. I was I was riding hard the entire time, but I had four kids, two of which, you know, I was blessed with getting when we got married, and um, mm-hmm. I just couldn't travel. It didn't mean I wasn't doing anything, but for goodness' sakes, you know, you're not you're not unable to go for your dreams, whatever the age and whatever mm-hmm. the level. So. I just really, really hope that it does make a big impact on people's lives because what else am I doing it for? It's just a sport otherwise, and that's not good enough. That's good for you. Good for you. Well, I'd love to have you back for a trainer's tip, if you'll agree. Would you like to come back and give us? Yes, I'm sure we'd all love to hear that too. So um, thank you, Bunny Sexton, for joining us on Horsemanship Radio today. Today's trainer's tip comes from Courtney Dunn, Monty Roberts Certified Instructor, about why it's good to have a plan and how it's bad to fall in love with it. Welcome back, Courtney Dunn. We had a lot of fun talking about confidence and horses and your reigning career that you evolved into. Um, We wanted to have you back for a trainer's tip, and you had some ideas that you wanted to impart to some of our, our listeners and our students. Please share. The tips I can think of, the most thing I would say when I was talking to other people uh, would be with the confidence, if you don't know, your horse definitely doesn't know. If you don't know what you're asking for them or what you want to have them do or what you want out of the experience, they definitely don't know. Um, They are herd animals and they're looking to you to be the leader and you'll have a lot more satisfaction out of it if you are the leader. Um... That's the biggest one. If you don't know, your horse definitely doesn't know. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the confidence comes from knowing what you want out of the situation and then adjusting your plan and then knowing it's okay not to know how to get there. So, and then just being open to try, try different things. If something's not working, change it. Um, 
also why you're in horses. If you're in horses just to have fun, then you should be having fun, not dealing with anything too uh-huh. difficult. Uh-huh. And just think about why you're doing what you're doing. That's good. So I've heard you say many times, it's great to have a plan, but it's bad to fall in love with it. All the way through. All the way through. And I think what you're saying is you're going into a training session or a a riding, you know, whatever session with your horse, you're saying you go into it with something in mind that you wanted to accomplish or even if it's just to have fun, but that you stay flexible within it. Did I get the gist of it right there or say it the way you mean it? That, that completely makes sense. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, yeah, cause the situation may change the, the baby that I wanted to wash today maybe was just weaned. And so today is not the day to try to introduce it to the wash rack or my horse hasn't been ridden in a month. So maybe today is not the day to take her somewhere that I haven't been before. Mm-hmm. It's all about adjusting the plan to have the best outcome. Mm-hmm. If it's not working, change it. If it's mm-hmm. asking too much, change the plan. That's good. Probably a lot of us who have had frustrating days can think back and go, I probably should have done that. <laughs> that probably would have been a better plan. <laughs> That's what That's was wrong. That's all have on the way down. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. As we're coming off, I could have reconsidered here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks I again for that moment of, oh, that was a bad idea. <laughs> Good tips. Thanks, Courtney. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. June 25 to July 1, Monty Special Training with Portuguese Translation at Flag is Up Farms in California, USA. Then June 30, there's a Horsemanship Radio with guest Temple Grandin and Monty Roberts. Listen in for that. July 6 through 17 is the Gentling Wild Horses Course, Woo-hoo. open to all levels at Flag is Up Farms. All guess levels. What? Everybody all can level. go. Yes, Jamie Jennings is going, so yes. everybody should be there. August 1 and August 2 is a Riding with Respect workshop. We've done a lot of these workshops on the farm. They're great at Flag is Up Farms in Solvang, California. Then August 3 to 7, 2015, Monty's special training at Flag is Up Farms. That's for the big group, and it's all in English. And then September 5, we've got another Night of Inspiration with Monty and Pat at Flag is Up Farms at the round pen and then up at their house for a big barbecue. And then October three through four, we're going to try a new little thing called a weekend with sculptress and equestrian Pat Roberts. And we're going to have mm. fun. And I don't think there'll be any boys allowed. I think that's the way we're going to run All it. girls weekend. Like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> you can see more at MontyRoberts.com. Or if you're old school, you can call to get Monty's calendar at 805 688 Six two eight eight, and for details about today's show, go to horsemanshipradio.com, where you can find links and photos and more information about today's guests. And as always, we love your feedback. Please mm-hmm. follow ev- follow Horsemanship Radio on Facebook by going to facebook.com slash Monty Roberts. And if you're a tweeter, you can follow him on Twitter at twitter.com slash Monty underscore Roberts. And go get the app. It's the easiest way to listen to Horsemanship Radio and all of the shows on the Horse Radio Network. Just search your app store for Horse Radio Network. You can do it today. It's quick, it's free, and it's easy. And many thanks to those sponsors, too. That would be Index Fund Advisors, IFA.com, Omega Fields, and Monty Roberts University. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at 
www.horseradionetwork.com. And until next time, have many happy horse hours. Mm-hmm.